In the next few minutes, our focus will shift to the subsequent topics regarding magnetic forces acting on currents. We will expand upon our previous study analyzing the magnetic interactions within moving charges. We will delve deeper into scenarios involving not just a single charge but multiple charges, there be generating a current in conductors. This study will be split into two parts. The first part will establish the laws, magnitudes and principles necessary for our analysis of magnetic interactions within currents. Subsequently, we will apply this knowledge to solve simple problems, demonstrating the standard procedures involved in working with these properties. Starting with the establishment of foundational concepts and laws crucial to our study, our initial focus will center on the analysis of the magnetic force acting upon a conductor conveying an electric current. Following this examination, our attention will shift to considering the formation of a closed circuit, a loop through which the current continuously circulates by this conductor. Starting from the basis of all the concepts that we were analyzing in the lesson number 8, taking into account what happened when a charge, whether it was positive or negative, and was subjected to a movement determined by this velocity vector within the space where a magnetic camp was defined. The nature of the magnetic interaction varies based on the charge's polarity. A positive charge yields an upward magnetic interaction, while a negative charge results in a downward interaction. Calculating this interaction involves applying the algebraic law of magnetic force contingent upon the vector product between the charge's velocity vector and the magnetic field vector, alongside the scalar magnitude of the charge in motion. In instances where both electric and magnetic fields coexist within a given space, considering both contributions, electric and magnetic, is necessary. Therefore, from the previous expression that we already know and we have worked very well in Lesson 8, we consider a conductor through which we are going to establish that an electric current circulates. Here, we transition from a singular moving charge to a set of charges within the conductor. Considering a segment of this conductor defined by a differential length, this segment moves with the velocity vector of the charged particles and the time differential. The charge differential will determine that it has a current. The charges per unit time are what define the current within that conductor. If we have that conductor in an area of space where we have defined the magnetic field, then each length differential where we have stored that differential charge that is in motion will describe or will undergo an interaction due to the magnetic field defined by the differential magnetic force. This force differential will be determined, taking into account the previous expression, by the charge differential, the velocity with which it is moving, and the magnetic field vector, without forgetting how this charge differential is defined. The force differential, taking into account the charge differential as defined from the current and time, and that the speed can always be expressed as a function of space per unit of time, we have that the time differentials can be simplified, and we are left with expression to analyze the magnetic force differential. It will be defined by the scalar product of the current by the result of the vector product of multiplying the differential line element of length by the magnetic field vector. Hence, the force acting on the entire conductor, spanning from, for example, end A to end B, rather than just a small segment defined by the force differential across a length differential, is determined by integrating the differential expression. This integration defines the overall force experienced across the entire length of the conductor. Thus, based on our recent analysis, this becomes the differential expression we'll use when dealing with moving charges within a conductor. Now, when the magnetic field remains constant, what occurs? I could extract the magnetic field from my integral expression. Additionally, if the conductor is linear, the entire integral simplifies significantly, allowing me to work with an expression indicating that magnetic interaction is determined by the product of the current and the vector product of the conductor's total length with the magnetic field. For this conductor of length L, subjected to interactions because it is within a magnetic field defined by this vector. We have that if my wire extends between point P sub 1 and P sub 2, this will be the interaction that is going to suffer in total, the total force vector for that whole wire. I have to bear in mind that the module of that interaction will be defined by the module of the length vectors, magnetic field, and also by the value of the current that is circulating and that what would be the sense of that magnetic interaction will be defined by a vector perpendicular to the plane. 
defined at the same time by the vectors, the length vector and the magnetic field vector. And what sense? This sense can be established using the right-hand rule, typically seen as moving from the length vector L to the magnetic field vector B. If we now shift our focus to the magnetic force within a conductor, particularly in the case of a loop where the conductor forms a closed circuit, this circuit could take the shape of a square, a circle, or any closed loop configuration. To simplify our analysis and gain a clearer understanding, let's consider a circuit shaped like a square or rectangle with parallel sides two by two of varying lengths. Let's consider that the lengths of these segments are A for the horizontal ones and B for the vertical ones. A current is going to circulate through it and we are going to have this loop in a magnetic field. Since currents are circulating through these conductors that form the loop, depending on how these lengths are, according to the direction of the current, we will have the length vectors A and B. For segments that oppose this direction, their length vectors will be oriented oppositely. We will have, therefore, that taking into account the previous expression of how to determine the magnetic forces, on this side will act a force 1 defined by this vector product, on the lower side the force F sub 2, on the left side F sub 3, and on the upper side F sub 4. Upon analyzing little bit what we have just obtained, it becomes apparent that F sub 1 is identical to F sub 3, although in the opposite direction. Additionally, F sub 2 is equal to F sub 4, but in the opposite sense. When summing up all these contributions, what's the resultant force acting on the loop? It totals to zero. Note that despite the net force being zero, individual forces are acting on the loop. They are indeed opposing forces, aligned in opposite directions. Although the net result is zero, having pairs of forces in opposing directions can lead to the generation of torques or moments, which is an expression used in mathematics. Let's proceed to calculate the resultant moment generated by these four forces acting on the loop. We'll calculate this moment concerning the loop's origin. Utilizing our reference frame, we'll compute the moments induced by force 1, 2, 3, and 4. How do we define the moments? It's the position vector times the force vector. The sum of all these moments leads to the following outcome. What does it convey? It indicates that the overall momentum or torque which intuitively aligns with our understanding, relies on the current flowing through the vector product of B and A. Recalling that the product of side by side defines the loop surface vector, this is crucial. Finally, this surface vector is vectorially multiplied by the magnetic field. In essence, we've defined the momentum through a double vector product. That momentum, moreover, we take into account the definition of that surface vector and that the multiplication of this surface vector by the current that is circulating defines a new magnitude that I'm going to call magnetic moment and that characterizes the loop and the result of having a loop with a current within a magnetic field allows me to define what is known as the magnetic moment of my loop based on the product of the current by the surface vector. The total moment of forces can be expressed using the magnetic moment defined as the product of the magnetic moment and the magnetic field vector. What occurs in this scenario? From this definition, it becomes evident that the rotation of the loop halts precisely when the magnetic moment and the magnetic field moment vectors align parallelly. At this point, the sign becomes zero, resulting in no moment of forces, thus no rotation. This conclusion holds significant importance and serves as the basis for numerous electric motors. Let's take a look at an electric motor's schematic representation. A loop depicted in blue features a surface vector that doesn't align with the magnetic field. As a result, various diagrams illustrate the different orientations of the loop until the surface vector eventually aligns with the magnetic field vector. In that case, what determines the speed of rotation for my loop? On the current strength, the magnitude of the loop surface, the strength of the magnetic field, and the sign of the angle between them. In summary, we now have a method to calculate the total force acting on conductors through which a current is flowing, not just a charge. When dealing with a straight conductor and a constant field, this expression simplifies notably. Furthermore, when working with coils, a significant observation emerges. 
These coils will rotate until the parallel alignment of the magnetic field vector and the surface vector occurs. Thank you very much.